a place where fantasies come true. Today, the Magic Kingdom will turn a dream into real life for Indy Speedway owner Tony George. Walt Disney World and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway proudly announced the first event of the new Indy Racing League. For years, Tony envisioned a new series of racing, one with greater access for more teams, more affordable racing in the American style on oval tracks. Today, after years of planning, it's reality. The Indy Racing League. Great names from the world of racing are here, like Indy 500 pole sitter Scott Brayton or Indy track record holder Roberto Guerrero. No one has ever been faster at the Speedway. And the man who won the fastest Indy 500 ever, Ari Leyendijk. Along with the new breed, tutored now by the veterans, the stars of tomorrow, already champions in their own form of the sport. But the racing challenge is unchanged. Driver and machine against the track. The road to Indy takes its toll. There's a new attraction at Walt Disney World, one only the bravest will try. There will be thrills for those involved and for everyone watching from the outside. So get on board at the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World. We're ready for the inaugural event in the Indy Racing League here at Walt Disney World. They began a while ago with the opening ceremonies with that most typical Disney flair, including the Florida A&M Marching Band. is in the land where dreams come true for the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World. Today is the start of the road to the 80th running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Hello and welcome, I'm Paul Page and this is the start of a great year in motorsports for us here at ABC. We've got so much to show you. Consider the Indy cars. Well, this year they will race in separate series. There'll be the IndyCar World Series, which you're familiar with, and the new Indy Racing League. And we'll have coverage of both right here on ABC Sports. Now, what is the Indy Racing League? Well, the IRL, as it is called, is a concept originated by the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Tony George. He envisions an affordable American oval track series, a, a league of tracks hosting the IndyCars. The rules for the construction of the cars, exactly like they were for last year's Indianapolis 500. And the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is very definitely a part of the league. This year, they have reserved up to 25 of the 33 starting positions in the race for IRL members, provided, of course, that they meet a yet-to-be-announced minimum speed requirement. And, of course, the 20 cars that have qualified for today's race have already crossed the first bridge on the road to the Indianapolis 500-mile race. The IRL season will end at the Indianapolis 500, and so that means the 96 and the 97 season will have at least five great league events. And what does it mean for drivers and teams? Well, many of the drivers see this as a wonderful opportunity to show their IndyCar skills. Consider the story of the most deserving Buddy Lazier. Here in this inaugural event, he has his very first poll. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, Buddy has competed in some 66 IndyCar type events, but for car owner Ron Hemmelgarn and Buddy Lazier, first pole position, his dream has already come true. But, Buddy, you're going to try and make somebody else's dream come true today as well. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, our team owner, Ron Hemmelgarn's uh, father, is in a bit of a battle, and uh, so we sort of attributed this race to, to him. He's, in fact, dedicated his efforts today. He said he'd like to make 
his dream come true for Hemmelgarn. Now, the man that was supposed to be and had earned the outside pole position, he saw it go up in smoke yesterday with only four minutes to go in the final practice. Newcomer Richie Hearns, who had been fast all week, had earned the outside pole position, but in the final practice session of the day, he came together in turn one with Eddie Cheever, a veteran of the Indy 500. Both cars were wrecked beyond repair. They went back to work, brought up backup cars. They're at the back of the field, both cars. And for Hearns, Gary Gerald, that's a tough place to come from. Well, he found out firsthand, Jack, that sometimes dreams can turn into nightmares, but here's Richie Hearn, their crew. They've worked the entire night around the clock. They were loaned a car. They've got it race ready. It hasn't been run at speed. Richie, what is your biggest apprehension or concern now? Well, one of my concerns is going to be just uh, some of the cars in front of me. Um, I really haven't run the car at speed, so I don't know actually ex exactly how it's going to handle over a period of a full tank yet. And... Um, you know, my main goal is really just to finish the race and get this whole thing underneath my belt. He wanted to start in the front row. He had the spot until the final minutes of practice. Now he'll work from the back. Paul? Well, you know, as you talk about the mix of rookies and veterans, we've got a rookie on our broadcast team, though he's a great IndyCar champion, Danny Sullivan, who uh, spun and won the 1985 Indy 500. What about that mix, Danny? Well, we've got a lot of experience here. We've got former champ, Ari Leyendijk. We have former Indy pole sitters. Roberto Guerrero and Scott Brayton. And then we got some rookies with a lot of experience, but in different classes. Richie Hearn, Buzz Calkins, Davey Hamilton, Tony Stewart. And then we've got a guy that's got both. We've got Buddy Lazier, who's got a lot of IndyCar experience, but none in a competitive car. <clears throat> and he gets a ride from Ron Himmelgarn, and boom, he's on the pole position. The question is <clears throat> the question's gonna be is experience or youth going to do it today in the winner's circle? Well, we hope you get that voice oh. cleared up. Let's go down to Gary Gerald, Eddie Cheever, one of the veterans. I thought maybe drivers were the only guys who might be speechless at this point. Eddie, we're concerned now about what may happen. We saw veteran and youth having a problem yesterday in that practice session. How key is that going to be to the outcome of this race today? I think it's going to be key to this race as it is to every other race. It was an unfortunate incident yesterday, and... Uh, I think he didn't quite know where he was on the track and he bumped into the back of me, but those things happen. I've done it myself when I started racing, but uh, we're ready for the race and I think it's great to be here at Disney. You've got a veteran and a youngster charging from the back. Should be a great story, Paul. Of course, we've got a veteran on our team, three-time Indianapolis 500 winner Bobby Unser. Bobby, what about this track? Well, it's a trioval, but I'll guarantee you one thing. It's got three totally different turns with different personalities, Paul. For example, it's a brand new track, so all the drivers that are going to be here are going to be have the same experience as the other ones. Time won't make any difference to anybody because it being new. Now, another thing, it's wide open throttle all the way around this racetrack, with the exception of going into turn one, they have to back off a little bit. A little bit. Now it's fast. Elevation changes in every turn, and you'll watch that on your television set. Number three turn. It's probably the hardest because that's where we've seen most of the accidents. Number one turn should be where we see most of the passing. All in all, though, hey, it's one nice racetrack. Of course, part of the deal here is to try and create some new race fans. There is one of them, Michael Ovitz, the president of the Walt Disney Company. He was down here when the track first opened, and he was excited about coming back and seeing this race. Right in the middle of Walt Disney World, as you look across the Seven Seas Lagoon, to the Magic Kingdom. We'll be right back. Well, here at the Walt Disney World Speedway, a little while ago, the close of the entertainment part of the ceremony. Now we're ready for a very special moment. Here's Jack Aroot. And Paul, this is a moment we've been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, to officially start the inaugural running of the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World, I would like to introduce the vice chairman of the board of the Walt Disney Company, Roy E. Disney. Lady and gentlemen, start your engines.
150,000 people in the stands here. The owners of these cars are so excited. One of them, Jonathan Bird, a long time IndyCar owner, Jack Aroot. And Paul, he's waited for a long time for this opportunity. What are your thoughts, Jonathan Bird, with this opportunity for you? I'm so excited. This is a, a, a lifetime, waiting for a lifetime of dreams to come together. What an opportunity it is. This is the second biggest crowd I've ever seen on IndyCar Oval Race. And I mean, this is back to racing roots. I just, for all the midget guys out there, all the guys that run those weekly stock car shows, hey, it can happen. Dreams do come true. And it starts at Disney World. Gary Gerald. The rookie car owner for Richie Hearn, John Delapena. The first time to be racing Indy cars, all the drama of the last 12 hours. What kind of emotions are running through you right now, John? Oh, I've been to the highest highs and the lowest lows this weekend. You know, Gary, we've been doing these interviews for a couple of years now, and it seems like, you know, we keep going up and down, but we're here for the duration, so we'll see what happens. Have a good, safe day. Thank you. The field of 20 cars has begun to roll away behind Johnny Rutherford in the pace car. Marvelous view, look at those stands, absolutely jammed here. Now let's take a look for this Indy 200 at Walt Disney World, the starting field on the pole, Buddy Lazier, his first ever pole in an Indy car. And Roberto Guerrero, a two-time winner in the Indy cars. In the second row, Ari Leyendijk, the winner of the 1990 Indy 500. And Scott Sharp, a two-time Trans Am champion. Row number three, Buzz Calkins. He spent the last three years in Indy Lights. And Davey Hamilton, the former Super Modified champion, is one of three drivers for A.J. Foyt. Row four, Tony Stewart, who became the first driver to win three USAC championships in a single season. And Stan Waddles, a former Formula Atlantic competitor. In the fifth row, Stefan Gregoire. He competed in the 93 Indy 500. And Scott Brayton, who has more Indy 500 starts than any active driver. In the sixth row, Lynn St. James, who started the last four Indy 500s. And Mike Croft, who has over 50 career starts in an Indy car. The seventh row is Robbie Buell, the winner of last year's Indy Lights race in Detroit. And Michele Alvarado, the winner of five Formula One races, including two in the United States. The eighth row, Johnny O'Connell, a former IMSA champion, and John Paul Jr., the winner of the 83 Michigan 500. In the ninth row, Johnny Parsons, the son of the 1950 Indy 500 winner. And Dave Poudre, he has eight previous IndyCar starts. The last row, Richie Hearn, last year's Formula Atlantic champion, starting in a backup car. And the 20 position belongs to Eddie Cheever, a six-time Indy 500 starter, also starting in a backup car as we look at those cars in that very last position. Now, let's take a look at our track description presented by True Value. Three turns here, as Bobby Unser told you, turn one, 10 degrees, turn two is 8.5 degree banking, and turn three, seven degrees. So, very, very flat, but also very fast with some nice, long straightaways. The chassis in the race today, we've got Lola's all the way back to a 1992 model and 94 and 95 Raynards. And the tires and engines, Ford Cosworth dominates it here. In the tires, Goodyear dominates. And then there are the rookies here on an oval. Guys with very little experience in starting this kind of race, certainly. And then there is the separation in this field and a lot of conversation that there's 35 miles an hour difference from the fastest to the slowest car in the field, 4.7 seconds. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, you talk about rookies. They're not just over the wall in the cockpit of race cars. They're on this side of pit wall as well. You see a lot of the teams have moved up to IRL competition from disciplines that never had pit stops, never needed to take on fuel. So it's all new, and when you get pumped up, the butterflies could become bullets and mistakes could be made. Right, Gary Gerald? Jack, it could be a huge advantage for the teams that do have experience in this type of competition. They know how to handle the apprehension and the butterflies. And believe me, every driver has said it's difficult to pass in this high-speed oval. If you can gain one, two, three seconds in the pits, it could make a huge difference in the outcome. It could mean the difference from being in the middle of the field to finishing as a winner or on the victory podium. Let's go back up to Paul. Of course, we've got plenty of onboard cameras for you. Eddie Cheever starting way back at the back of the field. This is going to provide a fascinating view. And then looking out the back of Michele Alvaretto's car. And over the shoulder of Ari Leyendijk. A couple of views on each of these cars for you. As the field aligns behind the pole sitter, Buddy Lazier, his very first race. Johnny Rutherford, 
is the driver of the pace car here, a three-time Indianapolis 500 champion. They look for that kind of experience up in the front of the field. So for short track enthusiasts around the world, a dream is about to come true. The Indy Racing League is becoming reality as the front row rolls slowly down the long stretch into turn two, a very sophisticated turn on a beautiful track engineered here by Kevin Forbes, who did a beautiful job, as you can well see. The cars now begin to pull alignment. Johnny Rutherford in the pace car is well ahead. The pole sitter picks up the pace as they come off of turn two and head for turn three. Watch up in the right-hand corner of the screen. The dream is real. The green flag is out from Wayne Sweeney, and Buddy Lazier jumps into the lead. Oh, Buddy really jumped that one, Paul. He must have had 10 car lengths up. I'm surprised they threw that flag out. Well, I'm surprised, too, but look who's in second place. Was Ari Leyendyke moved up as well in front of Roberto. Ari Leyendyke drums up in the second row. And he closes in now behind Buddy Lazier as the first lap is already in the left record book. 200 miles, 200 laps lie ahead. Everybody was a little apprehensive about the start. Long conversations among drivers and crews as we sit on board now with Ari Leyendyke. Yeah, so we all kind of figured that this is the first race. This absolutely is Disney World. They're not going to want to monkey, monkey up here or screw up in any way. Buddy Lazare, I know he's capable. I knew he was going to be careful. All right, we'll take a look from overhead as Buddy Lazare completes the second lap, followed by Leyendyke, Guerrero, Scott Sharp, and Buzz Culkin. Looking down from the Goodyear blimp over the track, there's first and second. Paul, that's something that all, often happens is when everybody's anticipating the worst, everybody gets a little bit cautious and sometimes makes a very conservative start. And I think with that jump there that Buddy got, it spread the field out enough to make it safe. Yeah, but what it will do for Buddy is mean that very sharp, shortly, he will actually be getting into the back end of the field. Now watch right here. You see that grass just to the left of Buddy? That's often where they run down the grass. This is going into turn one right now. Down almost to the white line, not to the grass. They have been doing it out close to the wall. Now watch, this is going in turn two. They're gonna go uphill. Look at him, up the hill, down the hill, down to the apex. That's through turn two. Now a straightaway. Now watch, really close down the grass right here. Now yesterday, everybody was running into the grass there. That's what caused a lot of the accidents, Paul. You can see on, uh, on Lazier's car, a tribute to Stan Fox, who, uh, has recovered, we understand, almost fully from that accident in Indianapolis last year and a get well to his dad. Buddy Lazier, boy, I'll tell you what, he's making sure that he is looking super. Now, here is an addition this year that we have for you. The top of the screen will give you the lap number of however many there are, six of 200, the leader and how much he leads by, and we'll track that all the way around the track. And then on the right side, we'll go through the entire field almost constantly and their interval back from the leader of the race. So we hope that helps. Also keep in mind, qualifying speeds were 181 plus miles an hour. We're gonna be watching during the race how they do with that. Right now, their fuel loads, of course, are very full because they're gonna be going for around 60 to 65 laps before the first pit stop. I think one other thing too, you're gonna to probably see some conservative speeds, Bobby, because these guys are trying to get to the finish. You heard what Richie Hearn said about he just wants to get this one under his belt. They all want to score some points. And I think you're going to see a fairly conservative race. And then you've got a guy like Buddy Lazare, who really, really has done well by sitting on the pole, has a record, wants to win. Of course, Richie Hearn, he started 19th. He's already up to 12th place. Eddie Cheever has been a little more conservative. He's only come up to 17th position. And already we have a driver out, Jack. Uh, we understand that Dave Kudre, who they may not have intended to run a great distance here. They wanted to make sure that he had a full understanding of running these ovals. And they've been very solid. The officials, the USAC officials, about telling people that aren't ready Wait a little bit, Jack. Well, you're absolutely right. David, this was a learning experience for you this weekend, but you got to start the race. Not a mechanical problem. Let's get some more experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I wanted to come here and get some more experience on this track, but as you know, I've, I've started about eight of these oval events, so. But the team is very new, and I was very new to the car and track, so. What does the IRL mean to you? It's a new opportunity. For me, it's an opportunity to drive again. Paul? 
So the opportunity passed already, but you'll see a lot of Dave Kudre. There's no doubt about that. Richie Hearn, still on the fly, has moved up to ninth position as Buddy Lazier is chopping through this field and now having to move past some of the slower cars in the field. So already we have that wonderful characteristic, the one-mile oval of traffic everywhere and plenty of action in this, the inaugural event of the Indy Racing League here at Walt Disney World. We'll be right back. Back at the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World, Richie Hearn's troubles continue. Coming off a one, he just grabbed a little piece of the wall, slid down to the inside of the track on the long straightaway. And he had moved up to seventh position from the start of the race from all the way in the last row. Boy, he didn't just, bump, he didn't bump oh, anything, Paul. No. He just lost the rear end. He was loose coming off. But remember, there's probably a good reason for this because he didn't get any time in this car. Well, he got the inside barrier. Gary Gerald had a quick word with John Delapena. He had a word with Richie on the radio. Richie felt like something broke or failed on the car, and that was the reason that he slipped out of the groove and got contact with the wall. That was the quick conversation with his car owner. Well, that would certainly, Danny Sullivan, support that replay. It would. It just looked like the thing took off awful fast on him. But that could have just been that he lost it. He luckily didn't do much damage to the car. It looked like he just bumped the inside wall with his nose. Uh, didn't look anything serious. Here we go. He goes up. Everything looks okay. Gets, he starts to go right there. The car's already starting to move on him. He goes a little bit further. Now you see the back end just gone. At that point, he's gone. He's just on the brakes now trying to stop it and not make any contact. So Richie Hearn becomes the first casualty of the day. The first contact, not with the wall, but with the inside Armco, as you can see right there. He's okay and climbed out of the car. But boy, a terrific run comes to a sudden end and a lot of hopes. Well, we'll return with more of the IRL's Indy 200 at Walt Disney World after this message and a word from our ABC stations. We're under yellow, 22 laps complete, the first yellow of the day and, in fact, of the entire season. Two cars of note, both Menard cars, have been in the pits. Scott Brayton has been in, and now Eddie Cheever, Jack Root. And, Paul, they're both suffering from the same condition. The cars are a little bit loose, so they took advantage of this caution. They've taken some wing out of both cars. They're going to try and tighten them up. So Eddie Cheever comes up to join the field as they tighten up on the backside of the track, getting ready to come back to the green flag. Buddy Lazier is still the leader, followed by Ari Leyendijk. But Tony Stewart in the 20 car, he's moved up from seventh place and is now in third, followed by Guerrero, Sharp, Calkins, and Hamilton. The pace picks up, and the green's back out. Moving a battle for second place, it becomes a three-way fight. Ari Leyendijk trying to hold off the charge. There's Stewart as he moves into second place, moves around. That was a good pass. It was on the outside. That's the stuff. There's your sprint car racing experience right there. Nice pass by Stewart. And that also shows Ari got held up a little bit by a slower car on the restart. It was slow coming off the three. Stewart had that run on him and got him into two. But those Menard engines have an awful lot of power, Danny. They do. Going back to the battle for fifth place, that's Scott Sharp in the black with orange trim, A.J. Foyt car, number 41, and Buzz Calkins right behind him. Battle for fifth place. Bobby, what do you think about this? Uh, Tony Stewart's driving the team car, of course, to Cheever and to Scott Brayton. They're both complaining of the car being loose. He seems to be running fine in second place. Well, that's because everybody has a different deal. Tony Stewart, of course, has a tremendous amount of oval track experience, and this is what would be considered a small oval for Indy, car, Indy cars. Well, I think it's only natural that he might have got his car a little closer than the other guy. Bobby, as we continue to watch this battle for fifth between Sharp and Calkins, you've driven the, the sprinters. You came over to the first front engine roadsters and then finally to the high-velocity rear engine cars that we know today. What is the key transition that a guy like Stewart is having to make? What's hardest for him? Oh, I think just having his mind being adaptable and understanding that you can't jerk the steering wheels. Ironically, these steering wheels are hardly being moved by these guys. Probably no more than an inch and a half is all they move it. So the guys have to never jerk it. And the guy has to be young enough and open-minded enough not to do that. 
Back at the front of the field, Buddy Lazier, the purple 91 car, and that's Tony Stewart in the 20 car. That bright yellow and orange machine oh. closing up, coming by, and Tony Stewart is going for the lead, and he's got it. Boy, there's the dream of the short trackers come true. He didn't have just that much power or speed. There was something wrong with Buddy. Buddy either had a little problem in the last quarter, or he's got an existing problem with his car, Paul. He Buddy really did here around John Paul Jr. He really did slow up coming off the turn one. There was something wrong there. Yeah, it certainly seemed like that. The 91 car, once they came off at turn one, boy, Stewart just had a nail drove by on the inside. Yeah, there's not that much disparity in the speed, so he definitely had some sort of a problem that's going on. So Stewart picks up the lead, the second leader of the day, now with 30 laps complete. There's Buddy Lazare right in the purple car. Yeah, he's coming back at him. Made a nice pass there, so I don't think that he's uh, he's suffering as much as we might have thought. Well, Buddy Lazier trying to come back full into the fight after having the lead snatched away by Stewart. Now Stewart is 1.3 seconds ahead of Lazier. I don't know if you saw that he came off awful tight off the three uh, there, Bobby, and he seemed to be in the middle of the straight like he was trying to signal the pits that he was having some kind of problem. And he's having a problem, no doubt about that. Now keeping an eye on Calkins as he makes his move coming forward and around to Scott Sharp and into fifth place. Boy, he seems like he's on the fly. That, by the way, is Brayton, who uh, we mentioned is having trouble. The second yellow and orange car, kind of difficult to distinguish the car number. Brain's already been to the pits one time. He's obviously doesn't have his car set just right because his speed's not up to power, especially for him. In fact, Brayton runs in 18, three laps behind the lead. So Calkins' next target becomes Roberto Guerrero in fourth place, and there he is. Right white 21 car. And this battle is only seven seconds behind the lead. That's just over a third of a lap. Calkins coming to the inside. Guerrero picks the high side. So he can't get underneath him there. You've got to go up that high side because it's downhill into the apex of the third right there. And Roberto Guerrero, remember, is, is really a master on these ovals. His victories have come on ovals, and despite his road racing background originally in Formula One, he's solid on these. Oh, boy, they get so close. Tommy and Guerrero continue the battle. Now, three of breath is too much right there, I think. <laughs> that was too close. Third car in that with Johnny Parsons as they put him a lap down. Show Johnny's experience. Boy, he was able to stay way to the right. I think he could see trouble brewing underneath his ball. Yeah, I don't think I want any part of that. Well, there was a lot of experience in that, but I think the Buzz Parkins also realized that was his chance to get by Roberto. Back up to the front of the field on board Ari Leyendijk. He runs just behind Lazier at the battle for second place. That's Lazier just ahead. Bobby, have you noticed how he's not coming off high up by the wall? He's not using as much of the track. He's got some kind of a problem in there. It's got to be what it is, but it's got some. Kind it's going to be in the tires, Danny. There goes Lion Dyke. Looks like he went behind the edge. Lion Dyke just dropped down to the inside and took Lazier out of second place. So Ari Lion Dyke up to second. Now remember, on the Goodyear tires, there's five different combinations the guys can run. Firestone's got two different combinations. Calkins also moves around uh, Buddy Lazier, so seems to be an on-again, off-again thing with he, him. He's definitely got a problem, and he's trying to get to the he's trying to get to the pit stop, or he's trying to get to a yellow and sort out whatever problem he's got. Well, Jack Aru, do you have any idea what the problem is? Because Lazier is coming in. Well, Lazier is going to come in because he can no longer fight a push condition on his race car and Danny Sullivan you know how difficult it is to manhandle one of these around a one mile oval they will have to make some adjustments try and get the car loosened up free it up as they say here he comes to a stop and we'll see if they'll make any wing adjustments or they'll just do it with stagger stop under green so his position is falling through the field very quickly well you can see him he's trying to describe it by turning his hands there yeah. and saying it's all over the place now, one, of the, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to change the compound no, on the tire. A problem. No, they have a problem on the right corner. It looks as if maybe the wheel is loose. Right front, Jack? On the right front corner. You can see that he had some kind of problem coming down the pit lane. The car was moving around yeah. too much as he came down the pit lane. Looks like the hub carrier itself might have a loose attachment. 
Indeed it is, Paul. Back to you. All right, so Buddy Lazier had such a strong day going. They're working in the pits. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, Richie Hearn has been released by the medical officials. Richie, tell us what happened in this scenario because you were making up so much ground so quickly. Yeah, the car was handling really good at the beginning of the race. You know, I actually couldn't believe that I was, uh, you know, handling that much better than the other people on full tanks. And, you know, I was just setting my own pace. You know, it may seem faster than everybody else, but I was actually just taking it easy. And I came out of turn uh, turn one there, and I don't know what happened. Either something broke or, it, like, it spilled fluid. Some fluid blew out or... And it just it just came around very violently, and I it had no warning, and I'm fortunate not to have hit anything really. I mean, kind of grazed the guardrail a little bit, but feel bad for the crew that worked all night. And they did a very good job of giving me a car that was fast, but getting a car this late is a little bit of a gamble. And how much does this dent your confidence? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I I was feeling pretty good in the race. I mean, that that type of thing that happened out there was just a racing thing. I'm I'm. Sad to have not finished the race and get one underneath my belt, but we'll uh, pull together and we'll move on. Thanks, Richie. Thank you. Paul? Well, two of the Menard cars, Cheever and Brayton, have had problems, but the third car, Tony Stewart, is now two and a half seconds ahead of the rest of the field and this battle that we're watching now. As we were tracking for a bit there, the battle between Lion Dyke and Culkins, you go on board with Lion Dyke. There is the top of the order for you. 42 laps are complete of the 200 laps scheduled here at Walt Disney World. The great USAC champion, 20 car, it's bright yellow and orange, a Menard car, Tony Stewart is the leader, and that documents his climb up to the lead of the race. Buzz Calkins has now resolved his argument with Ari Leyendijk over second place. Ari Leyendijk is third, followed by Roberto Guerrero. Now coming up next on ABC Sports, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, Raymond Floyd, and Jim Colbert play the senior skins game. And then on ABC's Wide World of Sports, we head off to Bulgaria for the European Figure Skating Championship. Five-time champion, Surya Bonoli, will try and defend her title. That's coming up next here on ABC Sports. So here at the Walt Disney World Speedway, Tony Stewart, to the approval of the crowd of over 50,000 here, is leading by now four seconds, Jack Aroo. Paul, the major concern for Stewart and his Menards team is fuel conservation. All of the Menard cars running that V6 Menard configuration all week were eating up an awful lot of fuel. We've monitored radio transmissions with all three drivers. They were told before the race, you're going to have to conserve fuel. It's awfully tough, guys, to conserve fuel when you're running up front, isn't it? Eight cars on the lead lap, you bet it is. Two cars out, that's Hearn and Kudrave. Buddy Lazier, after they made repairs, got back into the fight, but he's 16th and six laps behind the leader. And just so everybody will know, in order for Tony Stewart to do better on the mileage, the team will be telling him two things. Shift into a higher gear. They have uh, two gears to race with there. Plus, he'll have to cut back the boost on that thing a little bit, Paul. So what he's probably trying to do now is he would like to keep the boost up in order to stay ahead like Jack Root said, but he's going to have to cut it back in order to make fuel mileage and make only two-stop race pretty soon. A whirlwind around this track. Stewart just overhauled McKaylee Alvaretto, who is running in eighth place in the 33 Scandia car. And in about five laps, according to Jack Aroot, we should see the leader of the race make his first turn down into the pits. And part of the uh, concern, as I mentioned, was how will this mixed group of drivers perform on the first couple of laps? Well, they perform perfectly. The next question is, how will the pit stops go? Because, again, brand new series, many new teams and cars and combinations. Well, that'll be an interesting thing to watch as they come up. Gary Gerald? Quick report on Johnny Parsons Jr. JP is in the pits. He had contact with another car, apparently bent some of the right front suspension. So that's what the crew's working on now. He hopes to still get more laps. Obviously a giant uphill battle for Johnny Parsons. And now, as you can see, the lead is closed down and Culkins has pulled in right behind Stewart. There he is, that bright red car behind the yellow and orange car, the number 20 of Stewart. 
Uh, hey, Bobby, that might be what you you were talking about earlier, that he's had to turn that boost down, trying to conserve fuel to get to that window of those laps. So if this race goes all green, he only has to make two stops. Danny, both of us know how much power those Lamar's have. <laughs> we also know in order to make power, you use a lot of fuel. Uh, uh, and it's a compromise, right? That's right. And, uh, of course, we're seeing a V8 followed by, following that V6, and that V6 does suck down a lot of fuel. Of course, Bobby, that's something that's totally outside of Stewart's discipline. He's never really had to run fuel conservation. No, you know, any car racing is as simple as people think sometimes. <laughs> it's going to be kind of rough because uh, there's a lot to think about. Not only does the driver have to do a little bit of thinking, it doesn't just stand on it all the time, but the crew, they have to learn to work with the crew an awful lot. There's a lot of work going on in the pits. Well, in traffic, Stewart is able to pull out a little bit ahead to lead back at one point. And then on the next line, they have different measuring points all around the track. Calkins is right back at him. But now the report is that Calkins has slowed down a bit. Look at that as he's dropped back off the leader of the race. Yeah, you know, I just have to mention one thing about the tires of these. Sometimes the differences in the speed. The tires here have to be what most people call really hard tires. These things are pulling five and sometimes probably six G's in the corner. This track, average and like in qualifications, 181 with three turns that we've all seen. You've got a tremendous amount of side thrust, and it's really hard on the tire. So when we see the speed change a lot, often it's the tires that they're having problems settling into. Tony Stewart still has the lead of the race, 24-year-old from Brushville, Indiana. Champion in USAC sprints, silver crowns, midgets, 95, 94. Guy's got a great racing background. Buzz Calkins sitting there in second place, sixth in the 95 Indy Lights points. Gary Gerald. Just talk with Laurie Garish, a longtime Indy veteran who knows how to manage teams well, and Ken Anderson, their engineer. We asked him, how are you trying to play it? They said, specifically, we told him to back off, play it conservative, avoid any trouble, go racing in the second half of the race. Now, Lori Garish was my chief mechanic when I won Indianapolis in 1981. They've really got a good mechanic there. Well, and now Calkins makes his move on Stewart. And boy, he just comes around him. Now, you have to figure maybe some of that is Stewart driving a very heads-up race. Now, Stewart wasn't ready for that. Look at him. He slowed down, losing ground still. He wasn't ready for it. He's had to cut back because of the fuel. I think that he's probably got a fuel thing, and they said, you got to get back. Don't forget, they're trying to get to a certain lap. Because if they don't get to that lap, whatever it is in their book, they get to that certain lap, they're going to have to make three pit stops. And they only want to make two, so they'd rather give up the lead, lose a little ground, and try to get it back on a full tank. And let's keep one other thing in mind. Now, when this race started, all the game planning was that they're going to have a lot of yellows, and so far we've hardly seen any yellows, so that means more fuel being used. All right, so Stewart into the pits, Jackaroo. And, Paul, this is a first for Tony Stewart, making a pit stop and taking out fuel. Now, you see the cardboard sign. There's a cardboard sign being hung out. Simple things here in IRL. Reset the fuel. Didn't have time to make a board up. Use the cardboard. Of course, that means to reset the meter on the dash. It tells them how much fuel you use. 17.7 right? seconds. Difficulty getting it back into gear. And so for everybody back out there at home, you get the reset the fuel is you've got a fuel meter that counts off how much fuel you're using. He had to reset it to zero so that they know what they're consuming. We expect Buzz Calkins in within three laps for his first pit stop. And Bobby Unser, uh, we've been we've been tracking both of these guys coming out of the pits for Stewart. That's something that's usually pretty tough for a new guy, isn't it? But the it is. The clutches aren't quite as easy as you would think. No, but you know, you better light the tires up than you are to burn the clutch or let it slip. And he, he did a good job on that. The problem is there's sequential boxes. The drivers are normally used to coming in and kicking it into neutral, waiting to get ready to leave, then putting it into first. These guys, if you watch what Buddy Lazier did a little while ago, have to go from sixth to fifth to fourth to third and so on. So Buzz Culkin makes his first turn in for a pit stop, and he's very careful about it, Gary Gerald. He's in the very first pit box. The Bradley Motorsports crew goes to work. Here's another rookie driver, Buzz Armatero, watching to see if everything's routine. Keep in mind, now being in the first pit box, he has to adhere to an 80 mile per hour speed limit. How high is the adrenaline running? We're about to find out as he makes his move. We've got it in 16.2 seconds. 
watching carefully for that 80 mile an hour speed limit and he has to do it by his tachometer. He has no indicator outside the car to tell him how fast he's going as Ari Leyendijk comes in. Well, they don't, Paul, but what they do have is they have a button on the steering wheel that they set to 80 miles an hour, whatever gear they have in there, they hold that button on and it won't allow the engine to run over 80 miles an hour. So Ari Leyendijk, whoops, he stalls the engine. Leyendijk stalls the engine and they didn't have the starter engine right sitting there over the wall. That's one of those little fine points of learning how to do these stops effectively. Boy, it is. And you know, this is time that you just can't buy. You can't regain that sometimes. That's a tough way to spend your time right there. Especially on a one mile low. Having a hard time getting it into gear. Well, well Danny, as you know, another lap, they come by and lap them just right now yeah. on one mile over. There's got to be a gearbox problem now, and it's serious for Ari Leyendijk. So the 54 car, there it is, silver and black. That's Robbie Buell as he takes over the lead of the race. Michaeli Alvaretto sits now in second, and Hamilton is in third as Buell comes in, and we're cycling through the pit stops. The Magic Kingdom here at Walt Disney World, not all that far away across the Seven Seas Lagoon and uh, the Polynesian Contemporary, the other great resorts here. Our overhead shots are courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. At the control, Captain Dick A. from Pompano Beach, Florida. There she is, floating overhead. Well, the leader of the race, the bright red 12 car, that's Calkins. He's got a strong lead on second place, but Buddy Lazier Jack has had his problems. Well, Paul, as we reported during the pit stop, it was a front carrier hump. They tried to fix it. They tightened it up. It has vibrated loose again. Lazier came in, got out of the car, and this is the kind of racing we're seeing. They said, get back in the car. We've got a team car from Stefan Greg Gregoire. We'll take the front hub assembly off of there. We'll put it on yours and give you some more laps. I don't think I've ever seen that. So they're going to pull a hub carrier from Greg Hawes' car, put it forward on uh, on the Lazier's and put him back in. You're going to lose so much time. Why would I did it? that. I did that in Indianapolis in 1966. I'm talking modern times. Well, okay, modern. modern times. Doesn't happen. <laughs> well, I think what they're trying to do is he's getting out there. There's not that many cars that are going to be in the field. They want to get the points. It doesn't matter if he's 20 laps down. He could still finish in the top 10 or 12. If some other people have some problems, he gets those points, he carries, he carries them in the field. Yeah, we got to remember the championship, don't forget. This is the road dandy right here. So Calkin, the graduate of the University of Colorado, 24 years old from Denver, is out in front. I think something else we're seeing, and, and Jack touched on it at the beginning, was that we're, we got not only rookies out on the track, but we got some rookies behind the wall. And I think we're seeing that these guys are, are dealing with these cars the first time. Some of them are having troubles getting some of the things worked out, like this upright, like the thing that happened to uh, Richie Hearns, that maybe a line came loose. All that stuff's new to these guys. But, you know, in all fairness, Danny uh, Lazier's mechanics, that's Ronnie Dodge. He's been there for years. He's a good chief mechanic. All right, tonight on ABC, it's the Jeff Foxworthy Show. Redneck. And then, at a special time, 8.30, 7.30 Central, Patrick Stewart and Party of Fives, Nev Campbell star in the Canterville Ghost on Saturday night at the movies. That's all tonight here on ABC. You know, one thing that we also were talking about earlier was the fuel, and, and uh, Tony Stewart went to 71 laps, uh, including the passing laps, everything that he did. So if he goes to 140, he's got no problem to make it to the finish. Well, he went long enough to where it looks like if he if he keeps going like that he'll make it Danny but remember he had to cut way back on the power in order to make it that's right Eddie Cheever still struggling four laps behind the leader in 13th Jackaroot and Paul the report again he's continues to complain of a loose condition now that car was built specifically for this coming Indianapolis 500 it was a 95 car that they were going to hold back the team they bought it brand new at the end of the year they had to use it today but let me show you some this is the onboard telemetry receiving station for all of John Menard's three cars. But here's the problem. When Tony Stewart is out front, they don't have a monitor. Here is the sending unit for the team. He gets the information, runs all the way down here, delivers it to the crew chief, and then says, we've got a pin in one, two, whatever it may be. Shades of the past again. Well, a com combination of low and high tech there in the Menard stable. Besides a good exercise. Well, Calkins still in the lead now by nearly 20 seconds, followed by Stuart Guerrero, Mike Croft moving up into fourth place, then Stan Waddles, Michaeli Alvaretto, 
Davey Hamilton, Scott Sharp, Robbie Buell, and Ari Leyendijk. That's the top ten for you. As we've had one yellow today as a result of Ricky Hearn's smack with the wall. We'll return with more of the IRL's Indy 200 at Walt Disney World after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Back at Walt Disney World Speedway, 103 laps to go. We're approaching the halfway point. Wayne Sweeney will be giving them that crossed flags to show them the halfway point. The drivers like the sixth place, Michele Alvaretto. You drive with him now. He's moved up nicely. Was up to third just before the stops. Back in sixth right now. Another driver we're keeping track of today is Johnny O'Connell. Solid road racer. There he is in that white number 75 car. Three laps behind the lead. Same car as Roberto Guerrero's car. This boy comes to Phoenix, Arizona. Drives a driving school down there. Been doing that for years. Trying for Bob Bondrett. Trying to get in Indy cars. This is his first car. He called me a little while back and he says, what do you think, Bobby? We're going to be a little bit close to try to make that race. I said, make it no matter what it takes. You need the experience. He's already up to 11th place. Lynn St. James has been in and out of the pit several times in the last few minutes. He's currently 13th. And then there's Stefan Gregoire that's kind of given up his car to a friend. Jack? Stefan, what eventually put you out of this race? My gearbox is uh, broken. So we are not lucky because I did a great race. Very carefully. Very safe. And uh, so it's racing. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Johnny Parsons is here, and here's a driver who's been battling Paul in a 1993 chassis designed for super speedways, not mile ovals. You had a handful, didn't you, JP? Yeah, and the guys have worked real hard to try and get the car comfortable for us, even though we're at a slower speed. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate, but uh, I'm sure we'll be good at speedway. Tell us about the future. How is this all going to work in the big picture in your mind? Uh, IRL's just, you know, this is the first season and it's growing. It's going to get nothing but better from here on. Uh, everybody's really excited about it. Uh, you know, this is a big event. I I'm really happy to be a part of it. Wish we could have been a little bit faster, but I guess every driver will tell you that, won't he? It was contact with Buddy Lazier that damaged the suspension. Thank you, John. Thank you. Paul? So there's Calkins, 18 and a half seconds now ahead of Tony Stewart. Only two cars on the lead lap as we've just crossed the halfway point. My guess is with Stewart's car that they're gambling, much like Danny said earlier, on going to the end of the race and have enough fuel to unleash all that Menard horsepower. Hope they have the tire combination, enough fuel, and the engine running good to pull ahead of Calkins at that time. Six lead changes thus far among six drivers. Well, they, Jack also said something interesting there that Johnny Parsons had contact with Buddy Lazier which might have damaged that right front. That might have been the cause that worked everything loose. It certainly could. It certainly could. In sixth place now, the 14 car, famous A.J. Foyt car. There he is, Davey Hamilton, Jack Root. And, Paul, what a terrific story. Not only hooking up with A.J. Foyt, but for Davey Hamilton, a veteran of supermodified racing all across this country. His best friend and his roommate in supermodified racing, Billy Vukovic III, who preceded him into IndyCar competition and ran the Indianapolis 500 for a couple of years. Vuki met his untimely death in Bakersfield, California back in 1990. But Davey Hamilton never forgot that he wanted to carry the torch back to Indianapolis in IndyCar competition for his departed friend. On the back of Davey Hamilton's helmet is a simple phrase, in memory and to remember, Vuki III. Now, there are many fond thoughts for Vuki. Don't you know that racing family. Don't you know this is just the type of guy that Floyd would pick to drive the number 14 car to. Oh, without question. Remember him at the Copper World Classic. I mean, he, he was super. Now in the 14 car of A.J. Floyd, what a proud moment that is for him to be able to carry those colors. Well, it is still Calkins out in front of Stewart. Guerrero is third and Stan Waddles is fourth. Under the six laps complete. The globe that is the signature of Epcot Center here at Walt Disney World, just off to the southeast of the racetrack here. There is the road that leads into Walt Disney World and past the resorts and, of course, the racetrack. Buzz Calkins is having a terrific day. Stewart is 14.9 seconds behind him. The early leader of the race and the pole sitter, Buddy Lazier, is with Jack. Paul, it was a tough day for Buddy was here. Buddy, what eventually did put you out? You didn't go back out after you changed the front corner because you found another problem. 
Well, yeah, that's right. We, we had a, you know, just a fantastic race car. Even yesterday, we had a certain uh, problem, and we thought we found it yesterday. It was a lot like like driving a car that was very sloppy steering. You couldn't control it. The uh, the steering just took off on its own. It through the race. We thought we found it last night. The crew worked hard all night, and uh, even when we were running up front, the car would literally veer from one side of the racetrack to the other. That's why Johnny Parsons thought maybe you two would make some contact. We may have because I'm going by people. I'm trying to control. It's like having an old sloppy, you know, steering wheel, and that the car took off on its own. And uh, it's a shame because even even with that, the car was very fast. It was great through the fuel load. It's definitely the best race car I've ever had. And here's what eventually put the Delta Fawcett entry out. Kind of reminiscent when you say this 10 cent part. <laughs> well, it's only about 26 cents, guys. There's nothing on these cars cost 26 cents. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe one tie wrap, Jack, but not. Uh, <laughs> well, you can and see a broken one at that. See the disappointment in poor Buddy's eyes. I'll tell you what, there is a very deserving race driver. He's a he good race driver. And you know what? He did a great job, too, because he did it with a car that he didn't make a mistake. He didn't put it in the fence. He got smart. He came in and parked the car. Well, we take a look now at Tony Stewart. Look at the interval on the different laps. He's closing down on Buzz Calkins. So we may have a battle for the lead here once again. A little while ago, the fear was that we'd have only one car on the lead lap, Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, remember, we're talking about a game of conservation for Tony Stewart. He is utilizing the three-team effort as well, the three-car effort, getting information from teammate Eddie Cheever and Scott Brayton. The team now feels that they can cut Stewart loose, give him a little more slack, be able to run a little bit more fuel, and that's why he's picked up the pace. Well, right now, his teammate, Eddie Cheever, sits in 11. Scott Brayton sits in 15. Going back up to the front of the field. There's Buzz Calkins, 24 years old from Denver. Gary Gerald's got his dad. Well, he's watching anxiously, Brad. What are the emotions as you watch your son in his first IndyCar event and leading with a chance to win it? Uh, Gary, I'm overwhelmed. I just can't believe we're here number one, and, and, and to be leading this thing for any amount of time is beyond our wildest expectations. What's your, what's your biggest concern or worry right now? Well, just that the car will hold up. I think he can drive it, and I think he can hold on to it, but it just hope we don't have any mechanical problems. Is this, is this like a storybook deal for oh, you? And your Gary, team? you know it is. Thank you. All right. You talk about emotion, Paul. There's, there's tons of it down here. Calkins in the Reynard. The engineer is Ken Anderson, the best engineers in the business, and Steve Rittenauer is chief mechanic. Stewart, of course, has a tremendous amount of experience. And I watch that left front tire as he goes around the track. You can see how he gets down, almost touches the grass. This guy's got a lot of experience on an oval track. Believe yeah, but, but he's doing a good job because he isn't running into the grass. Bobby, he's keeping it clean. He's staying above it. And actually, I worked with Ken Anderson for years at Penske. And he's uh, got a tremendous amount of experience. He's a great shot guy. As we've seen, this track uh, he's got some up and down, some elevation changes, a little bit rough. And I'm sure he's got that car handling very nice over those bumps. Indication is that the black flag will now be thrown to the number two car of Scott Brayton. And the reason is that they say he's just been running around the track too slow and has now become a hazard. 127 laps complete. You know, and Bobby Unser, I think there was there was some talk about how would how would these first races be handled from an official's point of view as we look at Scott sitting in the pit area. And it was interesting that three drivers were told. You're not going to start here this weekend. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go to Jack Aru. Well, Paul, they're really just hunting and pecking now, trying to check and see if they can isolate what the problem may be in the engine compartment. That is not an easy job with an Indy car, as you know. You've got to take the fiberglass fairings off, got to take a look at the electronics. The motor at low idle doesn't sound too bad, but they say that they're not able to generate a lot of speed with the car. So now it's just going to simply be take it apart and try and find the gremlin. You know, but all due respect for Scott Braden, the answer here just a little bit, Paul, that his slow speed and the reason he kept on going is they didn't have really anything else to gain other than that. If they could stay out on the racetrack, they could get points. This is a, a very few race series. They need to finish every race. It's more important than ever. So they tried to stay out. Tomorrow on ABC Sports, we'll have college hoops coast to coast. Maryland takes on their ACC rival Duke. USC battles Cincinnati or Texas meets Texas Tech. Don't miss all the regional action on the Payne Weber College Basketball tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern 
10 Pacific right here on ABC Sports. They continue to work on the car, but Scott Brayton says, well, it's time to climb out of this thing. You get that many parts off of it, it looks like the day is pretty well done. That, that's got to be disappointing. I know these guys came down here with high expectations, uh, wanted to do awful good. And the Menard cars have tested down here so much. They really put a big effort into being ready and trying to win this race. I guess as much as I ever see. We watch Tony Calkins continue, or Puss Calkins, to continue to maneuver out ahead of Tony Stewart. Calkins' best finishes in Indy Lights have been thirds, and they have been on one-mile ovals in Phoenix and Milwaukee. So he certainly got the experience to run there at the front and to figure out how to stay in front. Bobby, what do you figure his emotions are right now? I mean, he's still got one more fuel stop to go, uh, but he's got to be pretty pumped up, and he's got to be keeping an eye on what Tony Stewart's doing and what that gap is. Oh, absolutely, because he, everybody that's running a Cosworth engine knows that the Menards or the Buick is going to have more horsepower. So they're all wondering, you know, if I run him out of fuel, if I run him low enough, the teams are checking on each other. All this stuff is just happening down there because of such a big disparity in the horsepower, which means fuel. You know, right there, I think we just saw a good example of, of how bright he's driving. He's been very careful on getting past some of these cars. There's the 20 car. That's Tony Stewart, second place, rolling into the pit. Doesn't Assume look like it's routine. coming in fast. With 66 laps to go, Jack Aroot. Well, it should be a nominal stop for Tony Stewart. As we said to you before, they feel they have the sufficient fuel to go the distance now. They're going to give him the green light. Stewart showing a lot of poise during these pit stops, trying to be deliberate, making sure there aren't any mistakes. It costs him about a second to a second and a half. There again, in 18 seconds flat, he tries to get back up to speed. And there you hear him. He finally lights the tires up at the end of pit road. Boy, see what you were talking about, he Bobby. He just about killed the yeah. engine. He almost bought the farm right there. That would have cost him one or two laps if he had killed that engine. Maybe three. That far away from the pits would have really hurt him. But it also hurt him just going out that slow. He probably lost a second or two. And he looked awful slow coming down pit lane. Roberto Guerrero moved into second place with that pit stop. And Gary Gerald continuing to track the Falcons car. Paul, they're already taking every precaution. They're talking him around, not on every lap, but they're telling him to be so very careful. They're trying to keep him cool. We expect his second and final stop inside of 10 laps now. They're conferring right now. Kenny Anderson making a decision. We'll see him in shortly. Let's go to Jack. Well, Gary, the man that sat on the pole for last year's Indianapolis 500 hopes he can do it again this year. But at the, Walt, the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World, it was an early departure. Yeah, it was a very difficult day for us. You know, I, I hit the fence in the warm-up yesterday, and I think something, obviously, I must, you know, have done something to the car because right from the start, it was just so loose, I couldn't drive it. I was just in the guy's ways, and I didn't want to create a problem, which I almost did anyway, so I stopped, and uh, I'm just happy to be back with Menards, and, and I think that... Uh, We've got more exciting races to come. Scott Brayton, watching the performance of your teammate, Tony Stewart, are there any concerns at all anymore about fuel, or can he go the distance and really crank it up? Well, I can't really say. Tony looks like he's running the best of between Eddie and I, and, uh, you know, I'm sure they're going to do everything they can do to get him in the winner's circle. I wish him the best of luck. Well, for Buzz Calkins, it's been 71 laps since his last stop. So he should be solidly in the window now due to stop in two laps, according to the team. There's Lynn St. James. He runs back in 13th place, 11 laps behind the lead, but he's been in out of the pits most of the time today. She's obviously struggling with something on that car. She's one that I talked to two days ago that was really having handling problems. This track, again, is so fast, and with the way it's built, it's a, it's a real demanding track for chassis handling. And Lynn's has been the front end, has been kind of weaving back and forth on her. So that's the problem that she's been having since she's been here. Calkins, Guerrero, Waddles, Michele Alvaretto. Tony Stewart up into fifth place now after his stop, and that's his final stop of the day. Then Robbie Buell, Johnny O'Connell, Eddie Cheever, Davey Hamilton, and Scott Sharp. That's your top ten. So keeping an eye stopped by the leader of the race should be due in within the next minute there's Roberto Guerrero coming into the pits he comes out of second place for this stop 
Well, that was tough. They put a he, his pit before him had their tires out. He almost couldn't get in his own pit, Paul. Giving a long push to Ari Leyendike as he comes out and the leader of the race comes in. That's the second time for him. He's obviously got some problem. I don't know if it's clutch or whatever, but he's got some kind of problem because he couldn't get out the first time. Watching the leader, Calkins. Nice, smooth work. Everybody's taking their time, and that can't be easy. And there's Guerrero. Calkins is still the leader. Waddles is assumed second on the racetrack, followed by Alvaretto. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, you can see as Calkins got away, it was very, very slow. And one of the problems was they ran out. They used every drop of fuel from the gravity tank. And they had to lean over, bang the fuel around the backside. They lost about three seconds to disengage because they didn't know that all the fuel had gone into the car. Roberto Guerrero had his problems as well as he stalled it trying to come out of the pits. There's one of the veterans having trouble getting it rolling. Calkins now coming back up to speed. And Roberto Guerrero, as he headed into the pits, faced an obstacle course. Here's a look at it. Another crew had some tires laid out that made for a very sharp turn in and a little bit of confusion. He started to turn into the wrong pit and then came back out and around. You can watch him light up the right front tire. The smoke caught him off of it there because he was disturbed that he couldn't get into his own pit there. That's something you don't like to see. The teams usually work together, but uh, again, they're a little green. They're probably not used to that. So the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World continues. 55 laps to go. We're back at Walt Disney World Speedway. 52 laps to go, but we are under yellow, and that emergency vehicle is clearing the course after Stan Waddles got into the wall on the actually the fence on the inside with a quick spin. Let's take a look at that. There is Waddles as he was walking away from the car after climbing out, so it's obvious he's uh, he's not injured. But it was a quick spin, and it did bring out the yellow. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, let's update the situation relating to the leader, Buzz Calkins. We talked about the experience of Laurie Garish. You've just come on with this team now. You've got this youngster out here in front. We saw all the fuel go into the car. Now, how much fuel have you got in the car, and is it a concern? Uh, we got uh, we emptied the fuel tank. Uh, all the fuel's in the car. That we've got way enough fuel to finish the race. Uh, we're getting fantastic mileage. Buzz Calkins is such a smooth driver. We getting close to two miles, uh, two miles per gallon. You're obviously impressed. Are you surprised? Uh, no, not surprised. I knew the kid was smooth. How about that, Paul? Thank you very much. Well, well, that's good. We were, we were worried about whether he had enough fuel. Now we know. Let's go to Jack. Well, as Gary Gerald was talking to Buzz Calkins, I'm talking to Ari Leyendike. And Ari, your problems that eventually put you out of the race started all the way back during the first pit stop. The first pit stop, I ran out of fuel, and uh, that had that gave me problems leaving the pits. Then when we went back and started again, uh, I couldn't get the, the the gear in first gear. I think it stripped or something. And then the second pit stop, no gears at all. But uh, uh, the team has done a good job with the amount of time we've had. The Bryant car today was running was good. I was handling good, and I think I could have been up there uh, for the win. But the pit stops and the problems with the gearbox really uh, killed us today. How about giving a grade to all of the rookies and how they've performed out there in race traffic and everything that's so critical to one mile oval competition? I tell you, these guys that have raced on the sprints and on the midgets, these guys, they know what they're doing because I really didn't have a problem with anybody out there. Uh, some of the guys that have are having problems, like uh, like some of the Menard cars, I'm not sure who's behind the wheel, but uh, you know they have a problem and they get out of the way and they give us room and uh, it's been really good. It's been really good. Phoenix, the next stop, as you know, guys, Another mile over. Well, there's the running order after 149 laps, and uh, the pace car should pick up speed shortly here because they've already indicated just one more lap to go back to the green flag. And then it's 50 miles, 50 laps to the finish. This yellow really helped out Robbie Buell. He hadn't made his second pit stop of the race, was able to make it under the yellow, and is now running in third place. Some others to note, Michele Alvaretto started 14th, is now running in fourth place as we go back to green flag racing with Buzz Calkins at the start of the field. You heard Lori Garrett say that he's proud of this kid and thinks that he has the moxie to go all the way. Stewart came across the line, of course, on the restart, close behind. And Robbie Buell is on a lap of his own, one lap down. You know, we really haven't seen any mistakes from Calkins all day. We've seen the pit be pretty good. 
minor problems, but overall, he's done a good job, I think. You know what, I think that most of the people out here have done a good job. It's been pretty impressive, and I think I already touched on one thing, Bobby, that you and I were talking about, is that everybody seems to be pretty fair about their passing. Nobody's holding anybody up. You know, it's uh, good dicing and traffic and, and good racing. Now you can see the interval back to second place Tony Stewart as he has Michele Alvaretto just ahead of him. Alvaretto is in third place, two laps behind the leader. So he's pretty racy today. And of course, new to an oval from the Formula One discipline, may not be real aware of Tony Stewart behind him and his position. Right, Tony Stewart also knows that he's only got 46, 47 laps left in order to catch Calkins. He's gonna have to hook it up, fuel or no fuel. He's gonna have to go with it. He knows he's got the power. He's gotta see if he's got the handling and the fuel to do it. Average speed of the race, 139.014 miles an hour to this point. Calkins, the leader, Stewart's now 2.3 seconds back from the leader of the race. Bobby, they fueled, of course, with about 66 laps to go. And their longest run had been 71. So he's, he's gonna use all the fuel, all the fuel but at some stage, he's got to turn it up, and he's going to try to win that thing. That's the way I see it. <laughs> it's either do it or else. You, know? you got it. So the story of the race is Tony Stewart has to catch Buzz Calkins here. We'll return with more of the IRL's Indy 200 at Walt Disney World after this message and a word from our ABC station. around Walt Disney World Speedway as Buzz Calkins, the leader of the race. Tony Stewart hasn't been able to close in on him at all. The Goodyear blimps now in their fourth decade of live sports coverage. Helping us here today, there's the Stars and Stripes from Pompano Beach, Florida, piloted by Captain Dick Esch. And Paul, right now, Stewart is moving up on Calkins fairly good, just while you were talking this last time, he picked up about a second right there. All right, you see the relationship back to second place, but look at how the speed is working out. Stewart is almost three miles an hour. He's two faster than Calkins I is. think it's like Danny said a little while ago, that he's got to turn up the wick. He's got to turn the turbo pressure up on that that Bernard engine to move up on him, and he is right now. And maybe they're going to gamble on the fuel. Maybe they've saved enough fuel to be able to utilize the power. And also, I think that Buzz may be being a little conservative right now because he dropped from doing 165 miles an hour now down to 161. But I think one of the things that's helping Tony is he's keep being pulled. He was being pulled around by Michaeli Alvaretto, who seems to be gaining confidence in running quick. Now you can see by. The indication there, Stewart's just been carefully reeling him in. Now 4.4 seconds behind, and boy, there's the advantage of that. The car held it. across the top of the screen. You can keep track of that constantly. And the battle, of course, is at the front of the field. First and second, Calkins and Stewart. Yeah, and he, he lost a little bit. You can see what happens when you catch a lap car. It's hard to pass on this racetrack, so they always fall back a little bit when they get caught up with traffic like that. Well, of the 20 that started, there are 12 still in the run here at Walt Disney World. Let's go to Jack. Fellas, Gary Gerald told you how Buzz Calkins has no fuel left in the tank or in the hose. Here's how much Tony Stewart's got left. See right here? Run the length. Right to there, about two gallons. See up here? It's empty. So they run to the finish now, though the presumption is that everybody will make it to the finish. Jack Aroot, you wanted to add something to that? Well, Paul, consider the fact that we've been saying they played a conservative game, the Stewart team, and now they know that if they have to come in for a splash and go, they could get those last two gallons. So right now it's all up to Tony Stewart, and we're getting down to the point that Stewart's very comfortable in the car. He's getting a lot like what he's used to, a 30-lap Saturday night event. Well, on the last lap, Stewart cut six pence off of Tony Calkins, or Buzz Calkins' lead, Tony Stewart in second place. Well, let me tell you something, though. If he has to come in for those two gallons, his race is over in terms of his position or battling for the lead. But you know, Danny, with Gambler, with Will, you just have to go for it. I mean, if you step to as much power as he's got, sooner or later, he's got to take a run for the lead. That's right, and I think he's doing it. I think he's got it turned up. And now we're going to have to see how Buzz Calkins responds to that. He's cut off a couple of seconds right now. Buzz is probably being conservative, but at some point, Tony gets behind them. We're going to have to see some great racing. Buzz is going to have to pick it up too, isn't he? That's right. And they will. Uh, 
27 to go. Calkins 1.5 ahead now. Here's third place. This is Robbie Buell. He's two laps behind the leader, but he's solidly alone there. Uh, Michele Alvaretto is the only one that can catch him, and he's running in fourth place. Two point two seconds. Watching the lead of the race. That's Buzz Calkins. Denver, Colorado, Bradley Motorsports. Came up in go karts and Formula Ford. You're on board now with fourth place Michele Alvaretto. Robbie Buell not in sight ahead of him right now. Well, now you get a glimpse of Buell there. So Alvaretto closing on Robbie Buell. Of course, that means a top three finish if Alvaretto can get around him. And then there's the battle for the lead. Also, these drivers got to be getting tired by now. Remember, if you pull four, three, four, five Gs all day long, these guys are tired. All right, the silver car is Robbie Buell, and the red car just behind him, that was Alvaretto. Now back at the front of the field, as Calkins comes alongside Roberto Guerrero. Still 2.9 seconds back, so comes up and surges back. That's all traffic. That's all to do with traffic, and Bobby made a good point. They are a little tired out there. We've been very green. Let me tell you something, the adrenaline's flown for those two guys at the front. So, 174 laps complete. Buzz Calkins is in the lead, but Tony Stewart is closing in. We'll see what happens as we go to the final lap. Danny Sullivan. Well, I think it was more than a brush. It looks like the way, watch him coming in here, and you'll see him, he's turning, and then boom, the car just, it just changes direction. He can't turn it anymore. Something went wrong there. You, if he was in the gray or just sliding or on the marbles, he would have been drifting up there. That car went straight up into the fence. And he very wisely kept it up against the wall. Let's go to Jack. Paul, first it was a dream for John Menard to simply run the Indianapolis 500. That dream came true. Sat on the pole with Scott Brayton last year. Now the dream is to win the first IRL race. And, John, the question is, do you have enough fuel with Tony Stewart? Well, I think with this yellow now, we're going to be okay. It's uh, real close, but I think we'll be just okay. Describe your feelings, because this is the first time that you've been in this environment with three cars out here near the end of the race and have a good chance for the win. Well, I think I'm doing more laps around in a circle than he is, so it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's been a, it's been a great day. Uh, I just hope Tony can bring it home here now. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. And again with Laurie Garish. Now, what is your plan? What is your strategy? And what are you telling your driver for this sprint with Tony Stewart in a position to challenge? Stay cool. Uh, we've gone to full rich. Uh, stay in clean air and keep the engine cool. And uh, the Buick has trouble in the traffic. When the Buick has to get out of it, uh, they lose a lot of horsepower. So it's, uh, it's best if we can try and keep the Buick in traffic. Any other concerns, Laurie? None at all. All right. Paul? All right, now here's the way they set up. There you see Calkins. Right behind him is Roberto Carrero and then Tony Stewart. So the yellow has certainly been a bit of a help to Stewart. The question is whether or not Roberto Guerrero will feel racy when they come back to the green flag. So we're under yellow. It'll be a little while longer before they get it cleaned up just off of turn two there. 179 laps complete. And we're looking at a dash to the finish at Walt Disney World. So the battle for the lead, but also the battle between Robbie Buell and Michele Alvaretto for third. They're two laps behind the lead. So as we come to the finish, of course, that battle might continue on. So two that will try and track for you. It should be a whirlwind with 17 laps to go. Pace well, comes up, Green comes out. You can see Calkins really laying back, trying to get rid of that pace car. So he would really go wide open from third two to the start line, and he did it. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that was just right. That's the advantage of being the leader. Well, we got one thing, though, that uh, don't forget, uh, Tony, he's now got that fuel helped him because that yellow gave him a little bit more fuel. He just got by uh, Roberto, Roberto, Guerrero. Roberto Guerrero. Now takes away that gap. They've got the clear air in front of him. He's going to be running strong right up and try to catch Cock. But boy, look at him now. He is very definitely on the charge. Cross the line, 2.3 seconds behind, but closing fast. You can see the two cars right there. On the left side is number one. The right side is number two. Mule, they both said to heck with it. We're going for it. Both of them are turning all the RPM and, and giving all the power that they can possibly give those two cars. Laps counting down, now 14 to go. Tony Stewart 
still maintaining that interval of about two seconds. So Hawkins is well aware he's there. And the assumption, obviously, is that both are going as fast as they can. And for quite a while now, there's no traffic in front of them. So the two of them are going to have their shootout. And for them, they recognize that this is a history-making finish, the first IRL race, the first race here on this wonderful track at Walt Disney World. And two guys who have never won in the Indy cars battling for the lead. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, you say Buzz Calkins knows that Tony Stewart's coming. He definitely knows because the crew keeps radioing out to him. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. And all he says is, okay. Yeah, I bet that, that helped my nerves a whole lot. Yeah, I, I couldn't look in the mirrors and see that. I don't think it's necessary. Really. <laughs> Bobby, what do you think the adrenaline level is in those two guys right now? If our one trying to catch one, we, we got to yellow out. We've got two cars into the wall in turn one. Cheever is one of them, and Scott Sharp is the other. Well, that's turn a bad one, 11 laps to go. Now the question will become, will they get this course cleared? Danny? Yes, and did you see what happened up there? Tony Scott slide. went around between the wall and Scott Sharp. He went between them. So the question there is, well, that's all where that debris is. He's got to be careful whether the he picks up a bump. The emergency vehicle blocked him, and he had to go, go up through there. And he decided, uh, if he had to, to treat it like a dune buggy or a tank, go over that stuff around yeah, him. But I don't blame him. I don't blame him, look but right look here. at all the debris to the right on, there. on there. What do you think he's got a, a chance of a puncture in that deal? Well, that's, that's going to be kind of touchy, but there's only 11 laps to go. Man, that was a gamble he had to take. I'd have done the same thing on that one. He's absolutely done the same thing. Sometimes the emergency vehicles just come out in the wrong time, but safety must come first, which is what they did. He just was there at a wrong place at a wrong time. So the safety vehicles become part of this. Now here is Stewart. Now watch on the right. Look at that. Now he's Whoa. almost going to hit the wall. He, See, look at that. He, he does hit the wall. He does yeah, hit the wall. Look hit. at the look at the mark going along the wall, and oh. there he runs over that nose. There's literally no choice, though. There was he no other place to go. He got caught in there, and that was it. Look at him. He almost got the truck right there, too. Yeah, I want to dr what the driver of that emergency vehicle thought when he took that step I'm, out. And I'm proud there. of him. He never gave up. And the report on the accident itself is that Eddie Cheever just closed down on Sharp. With some pain, they're lifting Eddie Cheever out of the car. You know, that's Eddie's second accident in two days at the same spot. Let's make sure he's all right. He just wants he just, to wait and sit there a second. He's shaking up pretty good. Well, yeah, when he, you get hurt, you have to sit there for a little bit. If people pulling on you is not the best thing. But he held up his hand that I'm okay, I'm okay. Just give me a second here. Well, at least he's walking. The crowd gives him a nice round of applause. But obviously, Eddie Cheever is shaken up. Here it is, Danny and Bobby. And he comes down. Eddie said, we're on board with Eddie here. All right, we're coming star. down into turn one. He's going in there. Sorry, that was turn three. There's now the start finish line. line. Boom. He got hit, obviously. Boy, you know what? That's almost an exact replay of what happened yesterday, Daddy. Yep. Yeah. So Eddie Cheever gets loaded into the ambulance. Scott Sharp, we saw him climb clear pretty quickly, and that leaves only nine cars left in the race and ten laps to go. Now, here's where the advantage of a skilled pace car driver comes in, because Johnny Rutherford can lead them around on the access lane, the pit exit lane, and keep them away from the accident scene. You can see him right there in the middle of that onboard camera shot from Eddie Cheever's car that comes up on the record. You know, the thing about that with Eddie Cheever is that he didn't know that he was going to get tagged in the back. That was a total surprise. And, of course, it's ironic, like you said, at the same place he had the accident yesterday. Those replays look almost exactly from Eddie's in-car camera, almost exactly like what happened yesterday. And today. I think he's tired of that by now, Daddy. I don't think he likes turn one. So as they come back to green, if they can get it done, and the crews, the USAC safety crews, are working as fast as they can to get this track clear, we hope that we'll have some green flag before the nine laps expire. But, but remember, we don't know what the tires look like from all that on Tony Stewart's car. And or, and or the contact with the wall. This is that yesterday accident with Hearn. You were talking about that, Danny. That's right. There he goes through uh, turn three. You're Hearn's goes Hearn. to go down. Eddie doesn't see him. Boom, contact 
almost exactly the same. He's in the same position. He almost ended up in the exact same spot. Boy, a pretty expensive chunk of wall for raining, these cars. Raining a lot of thousands of dollars there. Well, you can see there is quite a cleanup. A lot of oil dry out on the track to try and clean up the fluids that are there. We assume the report is medically good. If we get any change in that, we will update them for both drivers. Eight laps to go. Buzz Calkins is the leader. When they come back to green, Stewart will be right there for a run to the finish. We'll be back. Back to the green flag. Calkins chased by Stewart. This is a run to the finish. Seven laps to go. Stewart. Drives high, lets him know he's there, but Calkins is well aware that he's there. They come through turn one over some of the oil dry. That's not a problem with the race course. And keep in mind, we still don't know about the tires, about the debris, about whether, for example, Tony's front end is bent. We don't know any of that. So far, it looks like there was no harm to anything. Don't forget, when he ran up through all that debris, he could pick up those little splinter of carbon fiber. He could have a cut tire. Anything that happens the next couple laps. But this is the real shootout between the Menard engine, which is like the Buick, or the Cosworth. Cosworth in the red car. There's the Menard right behind. Five laps to go now. Calkins still holding on. Buzz Calkins looking at history. Deal is Tony no Stewart, he recognizes how much is involved as well. Deal is no longer a problem. Not with that yellow. And let me tell you, they're both going at it. it looked like the Menard had to jump off the restart with that more power. But it looks like Buzz is uh, starting to stretch it out just a hair. In third place, Robbie Buell is still holding off. McKaylee Alvaretto. We keep a track on the lead. Four to go. They flash across the line one more time. Identical speed. Interval remains about the same. Three to go. Using all the track they can use. Track. And Buzz Calkins now looking at two laps to go. If Tony Stewart is going to do anything, it's going to have to happen now. It doesn't look like it's within his power. It looks like just enough for Buzz is stretching it out just a hair. It looks like his car might be handling a little bit better. Wayne Sweeney already has the white flag in hand as Buzz Calkins turns across the start finish line. Now, a little less than a mile to go for his date with the history book. All up to the handling. So Buzz Calkins is about to join the likes of Wilbur Shaw at Milwaukee and A.J. Foyt at Phoenix, Jim McElreath at Ontario as the first race winner at a brand new racetrack. Walt Disney World Speedway and Buzz Calkins has taken it. Buzz Calkins, his dad celebrates now. Kenny Anderson celebrating 24 years old from Denver, Colorado. And Tony Stewart comes up and gives him a salute as he finishes in second place. Robbie Buell was able to hold off McKaylee Alvaretto to the flag. So it's Falcon Stewart, Robbie Buell, and McKaylee Alvaretto first through fourth. Fifth was Roberto Guerrero, then Mike Groff, Johnny O'Connell, Lynn St. James, John Paul Jr., and Eddie Cheever. Let's go to Gary Jarrett. Here's Buzz Calkins, dad, Brad. Brad, what are the emotions? Wouldn't have believed it. Never. Never would have believed it. I'm speechless. My knees are weak. I'm so happy for Buzz. He's worked so hard for this. And family supported him. And Ken Anderson came in. And Kenny's just, what a pro. I'll tell you, there's nobody like him. When's the last time he won some kind of a race? Because I know in Indy Lights, he well, was on we, the podium twice in third. Top five finishes. We had a couple of podiums. And, and we've qualified third of Cleveland. Kenny was bringing the program on. And we knew it was just a matter of time. I, I just, I don't know. Pinch yourself. It's Disneyland. It's Fantasyland. It's everything wrapped up in one giant red ribbon right now for the Bradley Motorsports team. On the beautiful red number 12 is Buzz Calkins now waves and acknowledges, though I suspect it'll take some time to truly sink in as to what he has accomplished here as the winner of the very first race in the Indy Racing League and at Walt Disney World Speedway. The final results, Calkins, Stewart, Buell, Alvaretto, Guerrero, Mike Groff, that's the top six, then Johnny O'Connell, Lynn St. James, John Paul Jr., those are the cars running at the finish, Eddie Cheever, Scott Sharp, Davey Hamilton, Stan Waddles, Ari Leyendyke, Scott Brayton, Stefan Gregoire, Buddy Lazier, Johnny Parsons Jr., Hearn, and Kudrave. And that rounds out the field here. Let's go uh, now as we keep an eye on 
on our winner, and Jack Aroot comes right in there. Jack? Well, Buzz Calkins making his way to his first IndyCar victory lane, the first winner of an Indy Racing League event at the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World, and the crew are trying to take all the paraphernalia out. He's going to stretch out after 200 miles of competition. The Bradley Motorsports efforts. Buzz, we got to get the helmet off because you've got to celebrate. You're the winner of the first Indy 200 at Walt Disney World. And it wasn't an easy one. It wasn't very easy. You had fuel concerns. You had this, the hot breath of Tony Stewart and a one-mile oval. What, what do you think was the turning point for you? Well, basically, I wanted just to get out in front and try to make as few mistakes as possible. I knew being my first race that I didn't have a lot of experience in, in wheel, you know, just the overall race strategy. So I wanted to try to take my time and do everything and uh, just not make any mistakes. Let's help him get his helmet off and his balaclava. Now we can see the face. Okay. And uh, it's got to be a very important moment for both you and your dad. We talked to your dad, Gary Gerald, did, and he was very emotional about this. Yeah. I um, still am. I'm still emotional. And Mickey's here to give you the congratulations. And uh, what what are your impressions of the Indy Racing League right now? I don't know. Right now, I think you can see from the race and from the fans that came out that this this series is definitely going. Um, I think it put on a good show today. Uh, there's a full field, a lot of competitive cars. So I think we're going to see them uh, for years to come. Okay, you've won the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World. Where are you going to go to now? I'm going to Indy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the tower. Yeah, but as we take a look at that moment that made the difference here while the verbiage changes a little this is the one time that you can ask the entire crowd where are you going and the answer is going to be disney world this is the moment when buzz calkins picked up the the win of the race over tony stewart let's go to gary well tony after that cinderella year when you won the championship in usac for midgets sprints champ dirt cars here you are in your first indycar ride now on the podium and you had a great opportunity what are your emotions like right now if you have to settle for second place i tell you what after hitting the wall on the last yellow when the when the record came out in front of me i was surprised we even finished but uh you know, I can't thank Team Menard and Glidden enough. These guys did a wonderful job. I mean, to make a car this comfortable for a guy that's a rookie, they've done their homework, and they have one hell of a race team. I mean, they did a great job. Congratulations on your drive. We'll go at a jack of road. Well, Tony George, this was your brainchild. This is what you fought for, you worked so hard for. Give it some marks. Jackie, uh, very high marks in my book, uh, A++. Plus pluses. I can't can't thank these guys enough for their hard work and dedication to help make this a reality. Uh, Tony and, and Buzz, man, Buzz was fantastic. A uh, lot, of, lot of odds, and they overcame all of them, put on a great show. We're, we're so pleased for them, and we're ready for Phoenix now. Looks about 10 tons have been lifted off of this great man's shoulders, Paul. Yep, a nice smile on Tony George, and there are the point standings as we leave the racetrack here at Walt Disney World with a new winner, a great second place finisher, and Robbie Buell up on the podium as well. Nice day, safe day. The only injury of the weekend, of course, Eliseo Salazar, who uh, has a broken leg just above the knee. The next race in the IRL is the Phoenix 200, Phoenix, Arizona, on the 24th of March. And of course, you'll see it live here on ABC at 4 p.m. And so, the IRL is underway. I'm Paul Page. We'll see you at the racetrack.